Today we'll be reading from Exodus 20, verse 1 through 3. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You may be seated. At this time, I'd like to welcome up our lead pastor, Billy Glosson, and I ask you to join me in, in prayer for him in our day. Father God, we thank you. We thank you for this place, this space that you have provided us to come together and worship you. God, we know that the church um, it is not the building, Lord, that we are here to seek your face Sunday and every other day. Mm. Father, I, um, I bring, bring Billy to you this morning, God. I just thank you for his willingness um, to point us to your word and point us to you every single Sunday, Father. I thank you for the preparation he's done this morning. I pray that um, any distractions he might have while he's speaking, that you would just take those away. God, that he would hear your voice so clearly that he could step out of the way to tell us what you were saying. Mm. Father, I pray for our hearts and our ears and our minds to be open to the word that you have for us this morning, that we can pay attention and that we can leave here better than we came. Father, I thank you for this time, and we give all glory to you in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Well, we are starting into the Ten Commandments today. Uh, these are commandments which occur three times in the Old Testament, and literally it means ten words. And so that's what we're entitling this sermon series, Ten Words Given by God, Written in Stone by His Finger to His People on How to Live in the World. And depending on your past, you might come with some baggage considering these ten words. There was one night a family was doing a devotional that included the story of the Ten Commandments. And the father looked at his son and said, how many commandments did God give to Moses? And the five-year-old son quickly replied, too many. <laughs> Maybe that's you this morning, right? Maybe you come in and perhaps you hear the Ten Commandments and you feel that they're stodgy or they're old. Sometimes we read the Ten Commandments or we see maybe an uh, iteration of the Ten Commandments like the Country Commandments that uh, we saw recently. And you see these lists of rules and you feel like they're this stuffy set of obligations given by a grumpy old God. I mean, after all, isn't Christianity about relationship? It's not about rules. My hope, Coram Deo, is this, is that as we walk through these ten words that you will see not bondage but freedom that you would see that when we live in the world, rules are necessary for relationship. I mean, I think we all get this instinctively. But let me just say this. We want to fight against legalism. So maybe when you saw that we were going to do a sermon series on the Ten Commandments, you thought, this will be interesting. Of course we want to fight against legalism. That's the idea that we're saved by our works, that we're saved by what we do. But if our fight against in our, in our fight against legalism, right, in our fight against this mentality that we're saved by what we do and we don't want to live that way, let's not lose sight that we're also called to live lives of freedom, which means lives of holiness. Jesus says in John 14, 15, he says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Before we go on, let me just say this. There is absolutely tension Right? If you read the New Testament, you will see this tension all over the place between faith and works. It's the reality that we fall into kind of two different pitfalls. Legalism, right? I have to abide by every rule of the law so that God will find me worthy. License, I've been given grace. I can do whatever I want. Both of these are pitfalls that we want to be careful of. And many times you've heard from this pulpit Right? You've heard me proclaim the beauty of God's grace, that we're saved by the finished work of Jesus, not our doing. This tension point is, it's work, right? It's, it's working through this to see the truth of what Scripture says, because ultimately, when we follow God's word, it leads us to freedom. And the biblical definition of freedom is not doing whatever you want. Freedom is enjoying the benefits of doing what we should. We too often think of the Ten Commandments as constraining us, right? As if God's ways are going to keep us in servitude and from realizing our dreams and, and reaching our potential. But we forget 
that God means to give us abundant life. Right? That's what Jesus says, that he's come to give us freedom and abundant life. This is what 1 John chapter 5, verse 3 says. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. His laws, 1 John tells us, they're not burdensome. Do you think it's burdensome to have the Ten Commandments, right? Maybe you think of these ten words and you think, oh, goodness gracious. But do you know how many laws there are in the United States? It's a trick question. Nobody knows. I'm dead serious. There are 20,000 laws on the books regulating just gun ownership alone. That's it. In 2010, there was an estimated 40,000 new laws that were added at various levels throughout the country in one year. In 2008, there was a House committee that asked the Congressional Research Service to, hey, can you guys calculate the number of criminal offenses there are in the federal law? And they responded five years later that they lacked the manpower and resources to answer such a question. Okay, God is not trying to crush you with red tape and regulations, friend. He's not. The Ten Commandments are not prison bars. They're traffic laws. Maybe there are some anarchists out there who think that the world would be better without any traffic laws, but I mean, maybe you drive that way. I don't know. I've seen some of you leave the parking lot. Listen, here's the thing. We stop, we go, right? People slow down when you drive by a school. You stop for school buses. You wouldn't be able to drive your car to the grocery store without laws. When you drive on a switchback on a mountain, do you curse the guardrails that protect you and keep you from plunging to an untimely death? No, no. Someone put those there at great expense for our good that we can travel freely and safely. The Ten Commandments, they're not instructions on how to get out of Egypt, okay? They are rules for a free people to stay free. Something that we got to keep at the forefront of our mind. Okay, so context, the nation of Israel has been enslaved in Egypt for a long time. God has just redeemed his people with his outstretched arm, with works of his power. We'll talk about that in a little bit. And now here they are receiving this. And what we need to keep at the forefront of our minds as we read through these 10 words is that God delivered his people first, then gave the law. You see, the law comes after gospel, after the good news of deliverance. God did not come to the people as slaves and say, look, While you're here in Egypt, I've got a few commandments, 10 of them, in fact, and I want you to get these right. I'm going to come back in five years, and if you've got your life cleaned up then, then I'll set you free from Egypt. See, that's how some of us view Christianity. God has rules, and if I follow the rules, God will love me and save me. But that's not what happened in the story of the Exodus. The Israelites were an oppressed people, and God says, I hear your cry. I will save you. Because I love you. And when you are saved, free and forgiven, I'm going to give you a new way to live. We need to hear it again. Salvation is not the reward for obedience. Salvation is the reason for obedience. I want to put that on the screen. Salvation is not the reward for obedience. Salvation is the reason for obedience. Jesus does not say, if you obey my commands, I will love you. Instead, he first washes the smelly, stinky feet of the disciples and then says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. All of our doing is only because of what he has first done for us. And so with this in mind, we come to the first word, no other God. This is our big idea this morning, our big idea. We are to worship God with undivided allegiance. We are to worship God with undivided allegiance. And we're going to break down each of these 10 words the same way. And so if you're a person that really likes organization and likes note-taking, this series is going to be great for you, right? So here are the the kind of four ways we're going to break this down. First, what does this command reveal about God? What does this command reveal about God? Second, what does this command reveal about us? Third, how does it point us to Jesus? How does it point us to Jesus? And fourth, how does it show us the path of 
life. Again, so we're starting here with this idea that we are to worship God with undivided allegiance. And so let's go first to see what does this command reveal about God. Let's look at our passage again, Exodus chapter 20, starting in verse 1. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. We're going to see what God is like from the ten words. And today, what we're going to see, again, is the exclusivity of God. There can be no rival gods vying for our attention. That word before, it means over and against. God is saying, nobody else is like me. No one else is like him, worthy of our attention, worthy of our praise. And we see from these words that God is the redeemer. God is the deliverer. Again, Israel had been bound in slavery in Egypt. And God sends his servant Moses to go and demand the freedom of his people. And the command is now given in the shadow of that deliverance, but also in the shadow of 10 plagues. The 10 plagues were so much more than just an intense pressure cooker for Pharaoh to take God seriously, right? Maybe you've watched the Prince of Egypt and that's your familiarity with Exodus. These were huge, momentous moments. And we kind of hear these stories as kids, or maybe we've read through the Bible and gotten to the book of Exodus, and we see these 10 plagues and think, wow, these are just these big, epic moments, but they're actually so much more than that. You see, each of these plagues was a symbolic defeat of an Egyptian deity. Osiris, whose bloodstream was believed to be the Nile, bleeds out before his worshipers when Yahweh turns the Nile to blood. In reverence to Hecate, the frog goddess of birth, Egyptians regarded frogs as sacred and not to be killed. And Yahweh slays them by the thousands. Egyptian gods governing fertility, crops, livestock, and health are all shown to be impotent before the mighty outstretched arm of Israel's God. In the ninth plague of darkness, Yahweh demonstrates his rule over the sun god Ra, whom Pharaoh was believed to embody. And in the final plague, the death of the firstborn, God shows himself supreme over the entire Egyptian pantheon by demonstrating he alone is the one with power over life and death. One God toppling all rivals. God says, I am the Lord, your God, the one who brought you out of Egypt. The message to the Israelites at the foot of Mount Sinai, it's clear. Before you can obey me as the God of the ten words of life, you must revere me, fear me as the God of the ten plagues of death. And the response required is obvious too, right? If the God who toppled all rivals, the one who took down everyone in Egypt, if he's the same God that's brought you out of Egypt by his mighty outstretched arm, the only logical response is to obey this first word. You shall have no other gods before me. Again, remember, Israel, your costly deliverance. Pledge allegiance to me alone. The first commandment is found on what the Lord did for the Israelites in Egypt. He saved them. He rescued them. He delivered them. He has a claim over them. When God says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, he's reminding them of the staff, the plagues, and the Red Sea that they just walked through. He's saying to them, why would you trust any other so-called God? Why would you trust yourself? You didn't escape Egypt by your own ingenuity or because the Pharaoh had great kindness on you. I put you on eagle's wings. I defeated mighty Egypt. You can trust me. This is a word showing us that there is no other God. There is nothing greater than God could give us than himself. If you've ever been to Theology on Tap, you've heard me tell the story of Martin Luther, that as the Reformation began to spread, Luther would go town to town, and many people for the first time hearing in their own language the gospel would celebrate together with a feast, and Luther would hold his glass high, giving a toast, saying, good creature, saying that this meal, this drink, this time, these little creatures are meant to stir our hearts and our affections for a good creator. The problem is, 
we often position the created over and above the creator. So let's see second, what does this command reveal about us? What does this command reveal about us? Isaiah 45 verse 5 says this, I am the Lord and there is no other beside me. There is no God. So why should Israel worship no other gods before God? Because there are no other gods. You see, for Israel, they would have to unseat this idea that there are multiple gods. They're forsaking polytheism to monotheism. They're going from many gods to one God alone. This is how it had been from creation, right? But how quickly Israel forgets this. So if you're reading along with us in our Bible reading plan, then you recently saw the cautionary tale of divided worship among the children of God. It seems that between his exile and Padan Aram and his return to Bethel, Jacob and his family picks up a few household idol stowaways in their saddlebags. I remember reading this one morning and Hannah looking across from me going, why did Rachel put idols in her bag? It was confusing, right? Though God has not explicitly commanded it, Jacob knows that this is a problem. Well, how do we know? We catch up in Genesis chapter 35. This is what we see in verse 2. So Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, put away the foreign gods that are among you and purify yourselves and change your garments. Then let us arise and go up to Bethel so that I may make there an altar to the God who answers me in the day of my distress and has been with me wherever I have gone. The presence of idols among Jacob's family points to the operation of a problem that we all experience, and it's this, a both and mentality. Yeah, I'll serve Yahweh. I'll serve God. I love Jesus, but also just in case, I'm going to offer devotion to these other gods as well. Dual allegiances. Can you relate? As I've been working through this, I found both Jen Wilkin and and Kevin DeYoung just invaluable in preparing for this series. And Jen Wilkin has this to say regarding Jacob's family having dual allegiances. It's so good. She says, This mentality hides in the baggage of believers today just as it did in Jacob's family 3,000 years ago. It's an age-old expression of what James 1.8 refers to as double-mindedness. Double-mindedness occurs not because we replace God with an idol, but because we add an idol to our monotheon so that it becomes a polytheon. The repeated refrain on idolatry throughout Israel's history will not be that she ceases worship of God entirely, but that she ceases worship of God alone. What does this mean, right? It means that functionally, we live as polytheists. We have a both-and arrangement. Well, I need God, and I need a spouse. I need God, and I need good health. I need God, and I need obedient children. I need God, and I need a well-padded bank account. We think, listen, oh, look, I totally love Jesus. I do. And we think that because if we at least offer some worship to him, that everything's going to be okay. But this command reveals that it's not okay. Right? Jesus himself says in Matthew chapter 6, he says, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. We may think that a half-hearted effort is fine and that all is well, but Jesus shows us that this dual allegiance, it's not even possible. We're not created for a double-minded mentality. We were created for single-minded allegiance. We are designed for it. We are made in the image of God to bear the image of one God. We cannot conform to this both and image, right? We can't conform to both the image of God and the image of an idol can't. Unfortunately, it often takes a crisis point to point out our folly. It takes that idol failing us for us to realize how we have taken our eyes off of the one who truly satisfies. There's nothing like a financial crisis to teach us of our worship of money and comfort in addition to God. There's nothing like a wayward child or a divorce to teach us of our worship of having the perfect family in addition to God. There's nothing like the aging process to teach us of our worship of health and beauty in addition to God. And it's at just 
this kind of crisis point that we find Jacob ready to do something about these household idols. He's penitent. He's just come face to face with his own failures and his daughter had been violated. His sons responded with terrible vengeance and when he had failed himself to seek justice and now Jacob is a man broken of his self-reliance. He's soured by his own cunning. He's a man familiar with crisis. He's a man at last learning to pledge allegiance to God alone. Whatever instability may be needed to bring us to repentance, the final solution to our practice of polytheism, of worshiping both God and something else, is found in Jacob's story. Look at Genesis 35, verse 4. So they gave Jacob all the foreign gods they had and the rings in their ears, and Jacob buried them at the oak at Shechem. Again, hear Jen Wilkin. Jacob could have destroyed the idols in any way. He might have burned them, thrown them in a lake, or hacked them to bits. Instead, he buries them under a landmark tree known as a place of idol worship. Determined to put the past behind him and live in the truth that God is his only hope, Jacob symbolically holds a funeral for the idols in the very place they were typically worshipped. With pointed irony, the place for idol worship symbolically becomes a burial ground for it. Do not miss the moral of the story. To rid ourselves of idols, we must put them to death. The story is told of Hanley Page, who was a pioneer in aviation who once landed in an isolated area during his air travels. And as he was preparing and taking off again, he didn't know that a rat had gotten aboard the plane with him. So on the next leg of the flight, Page begins hearing the sickening sound of gnawing. Suspecting that it's a rodent, his heart begins to pound as he visualizes the serious damage that could be done to the very fragile mechanisms that controlled his plane. He he thought of the difficulty of, if I have to land, there's going to be no way that I can maintain these repairs with the lack of skilled labor and the materials in this area. So what can he do? Well, he remembered hearing that a rat cannot survive at high altitudes. And so he pulls back on the stick. The airplane climbs higher and higher and higher until Paige himself found it difficult to breathe. And he was listening intently and finally sighed with relief as the gnawing had stopped. When he arrived at his destination, he found the rat lying dead behind the cockpit. See, oftentimes we are plagued by sin that gnaws at our life simply because we're cruising at the altitude of indifference. To see sin and idolatry defeated in our lives requires that we move up and away from the world to a higher level where the things of this world cannot survive. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. How profoundly this command reveals a heart within us that is indeed prone to wonder. So we've seen what this command reveals about God, that he alone is God, what it reveals about us that we are prone to wonder. Let's see, third, how does it point us to Jesus, right? How does it point us to Jesus? Jesus made it clear in the Sermon on the Mount that the scope of the commandments go way beyond our actions, and they search out the thoughts and intentions of the heart. You see, people think that, man, I don't want to, we're not under the Levitical law anymore, so we shouldn't look at the Ten Commandments. That's fine and well. Jesus shows us that we are actually held to a much, much higher standard. Each commandment identifies a particular sin, but behind that sin lie so many others. The Ten Commandments search out the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Each commandment, it speaks to a whole category of sins. And a proper understanding of the law will lead you to say one thing and one thing only I am a sinner. I need a savior. We can think of this first commandment in relationship to Christ in this way. We can think of it as the tale of two mountains. God came down on Mount Sinai saying, worship me alone. Then millennia later, he comes down to the mountain of transfiguration and said, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. It's amazing that the God who said, worship me and listen to my words, my rules, now tells us, listen to my son. On the other side of the incarnation, the first commandment means giving to Christ the worship that he deserves. 
Jesus is the one mediator between God and man. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. He's the one before whom everyone is going to bow in worship, right? That's what we just looked at in Philippians just a few weeks ago, that every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. As Jesus himself says, if you had known me, you would have known my father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. In other words, Jesus has the audacity to say, if you know me, you know God. If you follow me, love me, and worship me, you worship God. When you see me, you have seen God in the flesh. The implication from all of this is that if you don't know God in Christ, then hear me, you don't really know God. The first commandment can no longer be properly obeyed unless we worship the one alone who shows us the one true God. It's not enough to use the word God. It's not enough to just be like, well, I believe, I pray, I trust the Lord in a vague sense. It's not just enough for us to be a part of a monotheistic religion. We are not worshiping the one true God unless we are worshiping the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. On March 23rd, 1743, Handel performed his famous The Messiah. It was first performed in London, and the audience was packed. The king himself had come and was present in the great audience. The music goes, and everyone's listening, and then the the hallelujah chorus washes over the crowd for the first time. Can you imagine? Everyone is so deeply moved hearing the echoing words for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. And the whole audience couldn't bear it anymore. And they sprung to their feet, including the king himself. And they remained standing throughout the entire chorus. And from that time to now, it's always been the custom to stand during the chorus whenever it's performed. With spontaneous joy, the soul stands to salute the one who comes in the name of the Lord. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and to him we pledge allegiance. The coming of Christ, friends, it's changed everything. It's changed everything. So we've now seen that this command shows us God. It reveals our divided heart, and it brings us to the feet of Jesus. And so let's ask finally, how does it show us the path to life? How does it show us the path to life? When Exodus 23, 20 verse 3 says, no other gods before me, it could mean no other but me, or it could mean no other gods before my face. Calvin understood the commandment in the latter sense. He said it like this. He said that this sin here is like a shameless woman who brings an adulterer before her husband's very eyes only to vex his mind the more. I think marriage is actually a really good analogy for the first commandment. You can't have a both and relationship in marriage, right? You can't have a both and relationship with your spouse, at least not for very long, right? Suppose a husband comes home to his wife and says, honey, it's so good to see you. I wanna introduce you to someone who's very special to me. Don't get me wrong, you're also really special to me, but I've also met someone else. She's lovely and I'm gonna spend some time with her, but also a lot of time with you. I just want to let you know that some nights I'm gonna be with her instead And I think you two will get along just fine. You'll be great friends. You both mean so much to me. What do you think a wife is going to say in that situation? You know, as she's grabbing her baseball bat. I don't know. I mean, you think she's going to say, that's great, dear. I'm honored that I can still be a part of your life. No way, man. That wife would say, it's me or her. Make up your mind. Maybe with a few expletives in there. You know, I don't know. If the wife were to say that with a great deal of passion, would any of us think that she's being cruel or proud or unfair or intolerant? No. We would say that she's being just the sort of wife that she ought to be. She has every right to be jealous. We'd actually be concerned if she wasn't angry. Some relationships, friends, are meant to be either or, not both and. And marriage is a relationship that demands forsaking all others. And so it is with our God. Love, friends, is at the very heart of the first commandment. If we truly love God, we will love no one else and nothing else like we love God. Israelites had the Shema, 
It was so foundational. This is what it says in Deuteronomy 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Love suggests affection, but it's also a decision. The Shema called God's people to choose the Lord God and him alone. We choose God because he first chose us. And now, forsaking all others, we commit ourselves to him unreservedly. There can be no and in our relationship with God. We love and worship him above all others because he alone is God. Friends, Jesus Christ died for us. If you want to know what's the heart of God for me, it's that God pursued you in love. He showed you what an obedient, humble life looked like, and then he exchanged that for yours, taking on your shame, your sin, your baggage, and crucifying it to the cross of Calvary. He died for you. That means God in love has pursued you. And here's what else it means. He did this, and he proved He proved his love for you, not only in his death, but in the assurance of his resurrection. What that means is this, when all else fails, he won't. He alone is worthy of your praise. Jesus said that he brings freedom and an abundant life. So are you living in the abundance of Christ? Pursuit of idols, friends, it's a road back to slavery. It is. Ask the question, am I living in the abundance of Christ? Am I obedient to the first word? A key indicator, a key indicator for when we are in violation of this command is when we are not excited for God. When we have an apathetic heart, when attending church or reading the Bible is mechanical or routine, we can know that we're walking the path of life when we can say, I am more excited for God today than I have ever been in my life. Now, that's convicting. It should be. Because it starts to bubble up and expose the areas in which we are worshiping other gods. This is a place where we can examine our hearts. We live in the tension of a broken world, friends, we do. When we read in Revelation of that new city, that's to come, it stirs us with longing. I mean, we drive on broken roads with potholes. Our kids are screaming at each other, spilling juice on each other. Things are crazy at work. Life is difficult. Maybe we feel the pain and the sting of loneliness, and we look to Revelation with hope. We see, as we read of this new city that's to come, we see this in Revelation 21. The wall was built of pure of jasper, while the city was pure gold, like clear glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with every kind of jewel. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. It's this amazing description of a beautiful place that feels truthfully opulent, (laughs) It's beauty that we can't even fathom. But John's description of this new Jerusalem, it's meant to tell us something more. You see, it takes the things that we esteem the highest in this life, and it reduces them to the level of commonplace. All of these elements, right? Gold, precious stone, the stars in the cosmos, rulers, crowns. These are what humans throughout history have worshipped. The stuff of our dual allegiances, our both and mentality. These are the idols of the world. But the new Jerusalem is a first is last place. Where the things that we've exalted will be cast down to the level of their real worth. As just mere metal and stone. As mere human authority, as mere created lights that move at the command of their creator. It's a place where precious metals and stones are trodden underfoot as common as road dust, where our crowning personal honors are cast at God's feet, where the people and objects and institutions to which we've ascribed our worship will fall from their lofty places. It's a place whose inhabitants at last obey the first word, you shall have no other gods before me. 
Jesus, who keeps the first word in every way, taught his followers to pray that God's kingdom might come on earth as it is in heaven. Again, hear Jen Wilkin. Why wait until the next life to count as worthless what God counts as worthless? Why wait until the next life to esteem what God esteems? The first word invites us into the blessed reality of no other gods now. It's our undiluted worship that marks us as his children in a crooked and depraved generation. Today is the day for toppling our idols of power, wealth, security, and comfort. Now is the time for treading in the dust the gods of our sinful desires. To live this life unbound to the things of this earth is to anticipate the indescribable joy of an eternity in which every earthly pleasure bows to the pleasure of being finally and fully in the presence of the one and only God. Choose this day whom you will serve. Pledge your allegiance. Examine your life, friends. What keeps you up at night? What riddles you with anxiety? What drives you away from his feet? He's the only one who will never fail you. He's the only God who first pursues you in love before he shows you how to live. Worship him with undivided allegiance. Worship him alone. As we wrap up, before I pray, I want to give you three questions to be thinking of. The first one. What idol am I most tempted to worship alongside God? What am I hoping to control or avoid by this dual allegiance? What idol am I most tempted to worship alongside God? What am I hoping to control or avoid by this dual allegiance? Second, I know this is a long one. Who is it that I count on? Who do I truly trust? Sure, God works through means such as doctors, insurance companies, and prescription medicine. But when I'm really in need, who do I know that will always come through? Who is it that I count on? Who do I truly trust? Who do I know that will always come through? And last, third, am I excited for the Lord? Do I have a zeal for the things of God? Am I excited for the Lord? Do I have a zeal for the things of God? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for the grace, the mercy, and the compassion of Jesus that pursues us in love. You've given us these words, Lord, to show us how often, Lord, we look to other lesser things. Jesus, I pray that we would be a people that long for you, would you reveal to us, Lord, the places where we have had a both-and mentality? Where we think, well, yeah, I can worship Jesus, but also this. Whether it's comfort, whether it's power, because we feel powerless. Whether it's control, because our life just feels so tumultuous and out of control. Or whether it's approval, hoping that we can get others to like us. Would we stop bending a knee to these false gods these worthless dead idols that cannot satisfy, and would we look to you alone? We pray all of this, Jesus, with confidence. It's in your name we pray. Amen. <laughs>